Hey, Gibbs. Well, that's weird. Got it. All right. Hi, everyone. Marion Gibbs, alcoholic. And uh, thank you for those nice words, Phil. Uh, yeah, it's funny that, you know, it's such a small AA world and I'm looking at people uh, all over the country here that are on here and then how we form those friendships and AA is really such a small world. And when I met Phil and then I met him at a, I go, I might corrections intergroup rep here for East Tennessee and I travel to all the districts and Phil does corrections up there and in Kingsport. And so I got to see him and then I went to the picnic up there a couple of weeks ago. So uh, it's just nice how friendships form and though you don't see each other for a while, you know, you know that they're going to be there. And I know that the next district meeting, I travel up to Kingsport, which is about two hours away that he, that Phil will be there and he'll be out there carrying the message. So anyway, um, I'm really glad to be here. I need a meeting today. <laughs> I already went to a meeting. I go to my book study on Saturday morning. And unfortunately, we have me tonight. Uh, you know, it's been probably the hardest two weeks of my life or so. My father is 90. And uh, He's been in the hospital more in the last seven months than he's been out of it. He's been in five of the last seven months between hospitals and rehab. And, and uh, so a couple of weeks ago, he fell and broke his hip. And then uh, they over medicated him and crashed him. And I had to give the DNR information to them. But my father survived. And again, he comes out of it and he's mad at me. He's like, I've been counting on you because he's done. He's really he wants to be done. And. And I keep telling them, I don't think you're ready because you keep you keep coming through. <laughs> and so um, and so he's in rehab now and um, it's just been hard. And then <clears throat> so last Tuesday, Monday, I'm moving him out of the rehab and we get the call that my father in law in California is is getting ready to pass. So I put my we have to have the discussion and my husband thinks I need to be here with my family and. So I put my husband on a plane Tuesday and his dad, who had 46 years of sobriety, passed away uh, on Wednesday. And my husband's decided to stay on in California and I'm going to fly out for a quick turnaround. And, and then today I talked to them about putting my father on hospice. And um, I am so grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> when I was new, I went to a lot of book studies and a lot of step studies and there was a line and I mess it up, but it was how I read it. And it says, we so we joyously deal with the realities of life. And I called my sponsor. I go, what does that mean? She goes, because we're sober, because of that, we can get through anything. And for that, we're joyful. I'm like, whatever, because <laughs> that was not my experience. But today, that's my experience, that I'm joyful, that I get to be able to do these things for my family. And when you hear my story, you'll understand the significance of why it's so important. So, ugh, I didn't wanna start off crying, but apparently that's where it is. So um, my sobriety date is July 12th, 1987. I got sober in Lancaster, California and I saw somebody from uh, the San Bernardino area down there, Menifee. And then um, my home group is the Tennessee group here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, we meet on Thursday evenings at the Ebenezer United Methodist Church. We open more than an hour in advance so the newcomer can come and find fellowship and hang out with us. And uh, we can work with other alcoholics. And, uh, and then we have an hour closed literature topic discussion podium participation. It's kind of a California style meeting. I helped my friend, my friend and I are both got sober in California and we started that meeting and it has 25 service commitments at that meeting. And, and it's really important for me to have a home group and have a service commitment at my home group and be accountable to the people there. And, um, and then my sponsor's name is Cindy and her sponsor's name is Benita and Benita has a sponsor as well, whom I haven't met. So, you know, those things are the important things in my life and, um, and I'm grateful for all of them. And so anyway, I'm going to tell you about, you know, the book says, tell you what I was like, what happened and what I'm like today. So uh, I grew up in Southern California. I am the middle child, of course. And uh, I have a picture downstairs that I keep in my living room and it's probably from 1962. My father still has hair. My mother's got a big bouffant hairdo. My brother has a politician smile. And then I'm, I'm, I'm restless, irritable, and discontented. I like to say I'm a chronic malcontent because I don't like anything. And I don't like being around people. I don't like any stuff you're doing. 
and don't talk to me. And I just never, I've never been a happy kid. And so um, I think my parents knew that there was something wrong with me. They put me in tap, jazz, and ballet lessons. They made me a brownie and a Girl Scout, a bluebird, a campfire girl. I had to take swim lessons and modeling classes, etiquette courses. They forced me into being a candy striper. They just want me to do something, but I don't like any of it because I don't like any of you. And, um, and then I found alcohol. I was around age 11 and I don't remember my first drink. I didn't know it was going to play such an important role in my life. And, uh, but I just started drinking and, uh, but I remember partying all through my high school years and and I didn't have too much trouble with it, but um, it gave me the I don't cares. See, my brother and my sister, well, you know, my brother was the class president and then he went on and he's a state senator in California. And my sister was on the homecoming court and then she became an executive in a Fortune 500 company. And then you got me. I've been married three times. I've been in and out of jail. <laughs> you know, I'm all those things that your parents are like, oh my God, what happened to this girl? And, and you know, that's what I was. And um uh, but I think today that I have the better life out of both my brother and my sister. And for that, I'm so very grateful because of all of those experiences that I lived and the joy that I found here in Alcoholics Anonymous has made my life so enriched and so full. And because of people like you who, who shared your life with me, who showed me how to do it. And, and I see there's a lot of older people on here and I don't know, you know, we always get deceived. I met this older guy and he was like 85 and I thought, oh my God, he must've been sober forever. He had a year of sobriety and uh, cause we can get sober at any age, but I love the men and women who came before me. They showed me the way. They showed me what to do and uh, and how to do this thing. And they put out their hand and they put that money in the basket when they probably didn't even have it. But it was so a drunk girl like me could get here. And uh, and so you know, I I started drinking and I moved down to Los Angeles. I mean, I came from the high desert. It's it's hideous. It's forty mile an hour winds and uh, tumbleweeds that blow through. And and uh, the only gated neighborhood we have is the state prison. And so it's not a very high end town, but you know, that's where I grew up in. And I moved down to Los Angeles and that boyfriend that I had from high school and I got married and I, I don't, shouldn't be married. I mean, I don't know anything about having a relationship because everything's about me because see, I sought that attention out at home. I can't get the good attention. I seek out bad attention at home. And now I get married and I expect all of his attention to go for me. And it's exhausting for him. And one day he comes home from work and he said, you know, I'm really, I, I, I just can't do this anymore. I'm leaving. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I'm unhappy. I'm like, well, how, how's that possible? Because I'm happy because he's doing everything I've asked him to do. And he just says, yeah, I got to go. And so he left and I went to work the next day. And I said to the gals at my job, I said, are you guys going out this weekend? And they said, you, yeah. And I said, well, can I go along? And they said, sure. So they invited me out and they went to a nightclub in Los Angeles and it was playing Madonna and Shaka Khan. And I'm like, oh my God. I mean, my first concert was Led Zeppelin, 1977. I don't know anything about Madonna and Shaka Khan. And they said, here, have one of these. And it's a Long Island iced teas. And about eight Long Island iced teas later, I'm like, Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan. Woo, I loved it. I love the smoke. I love the men. I love the music. I loved everything about the bar. Alcohol became the great salve in my life. It took care of all that pain. And I cried one day over the loss of that marriage and I hated it. And I got showered, I got dressed and I went to the bar because that's what I did. Things were beginning to happen behind my drinking and my roommate would tell me things. And she'd say, well, let me look at somebody on there. She'd say, oh, I can't believe you said that to Karen. I said, said what? And she'd tell me what I'd said. And I go, oh, is she mad? Oh, she was pissed. And I said, well, I don't even like Karen but I don't remember saying anything to Karen because I'm a blackout drinker. As things progressed, she'd say, I can't believe you did that. And I'd said, did what? And then she'd tell me, I'm like, oh, oh no, tell me I didn't do that. She goes, oh, you did. And I'm like, oh my God. Near the end of the friendship, but it wasn't the end of my drinking, she'd say, get out. I'm like, what? You know what you did, Mary, and get out. And I don't know what I've done. And so I told her that I was drinking a little too much and I was going to cut back after the Halloween party. Now, I never thought about not drinking. I mean, that never even occurred to me not to drink. I just going to try to control it. And so, but I got arrested on October 30th, 1985, pulling into my garage in Van Nuys, California. And, uh, and I went to jail on a DUI and it was great because I got a court card that sent me to six AA meetings and a restricted license. So I could only drive to work and to my, and to AA and a hospital therapy group. So I went to the, this meeting 
I don't know if they sent me to this one, but it was a Saturday night. The guy was very funny. He was a skid row drunk who got sober and he became a lawyer. And he'd lived in a cardboard box before that. And I thought, geez, if I lived in a box, I'd go to AA too. I don't identify with that guy. Yet I get very close to that kind of living. And so I go and tell that little hospital therapy group, you know, if I have to suffer, at least the guy was funny. And they said, better than that, there's a great bar next door. And sure enough, I put my court card in the basket. I went next door, I ordered a beer and I played darts. And I never heard the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I continued to drink on that. And, uh, you know, uh, one day I came home and I got a note from my roommate. That was in October. By February 1st, there's a note that she moved out while I was at work. And it said, you scare me. And I was mad. <laughs> I was mad because the rent was due, not because my best friend had moved out of the house. But you know what? People are seeing, witnessing what happens to me when I drink. And I'm starting to scare people. And uh, it's now becoming all consuming. And I drink myself out of that job. And uh, pretty soon I'm living in this apartment and I don't pay any more rent. And uh, I don't have, I have money, but that would require me to go to the post office to buy postage at the time. And I couldn't do that. So I just don't have any more electricity. So I've solved the problem by throwing an extension cord from the parking structure up over the balcony. And I plug in a stereo fan and the lamp. I have 50 bags of garbage that I'm picking the cigarette butts out of because, you know, if you can't go next door, then you can't go next door. And then uh, I don't have a phone, so I wired up to my neighbor's phone. So like once a week, I can order a Domino's pizza and a six pack of Coke. And I'm OK living the way I'm living. The book says our alcoholic life becomes the only normal one we know. And I'm OK living this way as long as I have something to drink. And I continue to drink that way. And um, I end up in jail again. I have eight warrants on that DUI, but I have another charge and I go to jail and, and they send me down to civil brand. I'm 25 years old at the time and um, I'm looking really bad, but I don't think I look that bad. And I'm going to tell you how bad I looked. I, uh, they sent me down to the main county jail, which was civil brand Institute. And I have to come back to court and I'm lined up with all you women. And I want my own bus. Cause I don't think I need to sit on the bus with you guys because I think I'm special. And uh, I keep, I'm all cuffed up and I keep standing back till I'm the last girl standing. And then I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get my own bus, but I don't get my own bus. They put me on the men's county bus. And you know, you're looking really bad when you're on the men's county bus and you're not getting one cat call. I mean, really, it's, it's sad what I look like. And, uh, you know, and I get out of jail and I beg somebody to come get me and uh, my car is still impounded. And uh, I get back to my apartment like three days later and my stuff is gone. And I ask where my stuff went and a neighbor said, Mary and your folks were here. Well, I don't want to call my mom and dad. And uh, so I call my sister-in-law and she said, Mary, and when your folks were moving you out, your dad had a heart attack. So because my parents break into that uh, apartment and because I don't have any power, the, uh, the food I did have had got maggots in it. And they walk into my apartment and they smell a rotting stench and they think it's my body and they're looking for me. And one time my mother had called and said, Mary, we're so worried about you. I said, you know, when you see my picture on TV that says, do you know this girl? Then you worry, get off my back. Because that's how I treat people when I drink. And I wait until my dad gets out of the hospital. I borrow a car and I come up and I have a whole story about why I'm living that way. And I go back to California, uh, back down to Van Nuys and I get my car out of impound and, uh, and I live in there drinking like that for another week. And then there's a knock on the door and it's my mom and dad. And uh, they said, you can't keep living like this. You need to come up. You need to get your life in order. So I leave whatever I have there and I move back to my parents' house in Lancaster and I'm going to go water skiing with some non-alcoholic friends. But, you know, even though I have this husband, I got a biker boyfriend. And uh, so I, uh, he takes me, we go up there and I don't go water skiing. I drink at a bar all weekend. And when I get home, my parents, my car has been impounded or repossessed. And my mom says, you've been lying all along. You have two options today. You're going to go get some help. We're going to drop you to the streets of LA or you're, or, you know, or go get help. What do you want to do? And I'm debating because the book says dying an alcoholic death or living by spiritual principles aren't easy alternatives to face. And I'm thinking, where can I go? And when I can't even come up with where to go, I said, well, I guess I'll go get help. So my folks walked me down the hallway at Antelope Valley Hospital, and there were seven guys in that room. And I said, boy, I hope that's where I'm going. Because my primary purpose were those seven men. It's not about getting sober in AA. 
And so I come to this treatment center and uh, I'm not alcoholic. I join another fellowship because I don't want to be with you people because I want to get married and have 2.2 children and serve wine on my table because I'm 25 years old and I can't imagine not ever drinking alcohol again. I don't like children and I don't like wine, but boy, that's the mindset that I got when I'm sitting in that rehab. And I hook up with that boyfriend while I'm in there. And the people who carry the message in California, we call it H&I, hospitals and institutions. Here we call it treatment and correction. They carried in that message to me. And they saved my life because it planted the seed, though I wasn't ready to get sober. And they would come up and this little awful woman, she was so nice. She just celebrated 43 years of sobriety. She's like, my name is Vicki, I'm alcoholic. I'd like to talk about this here. I'm like, ugh. And we'd read the next paragraph. My name is Vicki, I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to talk about this. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> it's so funny that I've become that Vicki now. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I did the treatment center idea, which is 90 meetings in 90 days. The big book says try not drinking for a year. And good chance you're not going to be able to if you're a real alcoholic. And so I did that 90 meetings in 90 days. I move in with that boyfriend and and then he comes home and uh, he's loaded. And I said, baby, if you're going, I'm going. And I got some tequila and I spent another eight and a half months out. I moved nine times my last year of drinking. And so I moved back down to Los Angeles and um, I talk a girlfriend into a job. And I'm just going to tell you the last couple stories. So uh, I'm only going to drink on Fridays and Saturday nights. Well, then I don't work hard on Fridays. I work for a law firm. So I throw in Thursday night and then it would roll over. And then it's every day of the week. And, and now I'm calling in sick and my grandmother's died three times. And I, I, I can't even come up with any more lies. I mean, how can you, I just couldn't lie anymore. So I unplugged my phone from the wall because that's what we had back then. And, um, I don't show up for three days and they call the sheriff's department up in Tahunga. And uh, they said, we think our secretary has been murdered. So I'm passed out drunk on the couch with the boyfriend. And I hear the knock and I got this crack and I could see this shiny black boots. And I'm like, Shh, it's cops. Well, they're not leaving, but I'm not answering. So we have a standoff. Eventually they open the window. And what happens is, uh, you know, they say what's going on and I have to let him in. And he sees the bruises all over my arm. And immediately I concoct a story. I said, I was down at the grocery store, this guy, <laughs> he tried to abduct me. I give him a full description of the guy in the van he's driving. They notify my employer and says, your secretary was assaulted. My employer sends me a bouquet, swear to God, this big, this high, and it says, take the rest of the week off. I'm like, nice, <laughs> right? So I go back to uh, work on Monday and I wear just the right thing so I can roll up my sleeves and show my boss my, my bruises from the abduction and I relived the story with him. And now there's only like two girls talking to me left in that office. And I go get, relive the conversation with them, the things that happened. And uh, you know what? And the cop had given me a card for counseling. And my head says, if you don't go, they're gonna know you're lying. Cause the book says I can no longer differentiate the true from the false. So I go get counseling for an assault that never even happened. And so I'm going to tell you just my last week of drinking. So it's 4th of July weekend, 1987. I know what happens when I, and we decide to go to Mexico, me and the girls. And I know what I do in Mexico. I'm going to drink tequila. And the last thing I know is I'm dancing. And the next thing I know, I come to and I got a black eye and a fat lip, cracked ribs, no panties, parked in the desert. My money's gone. And I'm like, oh, my God. I drive back to the hotel where I don't have a key. The maid lets me in. My friends are gone. And I'm like, well, they couldn't have gone far. I drove, even though their luggage is gone. I don't even, you know, I don't know what to do. So I sleep it off and they still weren't back. So I laid by the pool until the sun started to set and I realized they're not coming back. So I come up across the border and uh, I put in a phone call and apparently I got in a fist fight with them and the federales and I tried to run my friends over and the federales took them to the border and they caught a Greyhound bus home and they called my family and said, she's crazy. They thought I was on drugs. To my knowledge, I didn't do anything other than alcohol. But that's what happens to me when I drink. But yet the next day, my head says, you can have just two, just two. And I have two. And the next day, I only have two. By the third day, I'm drinking like it's ginger ale. So July 11th, 1987 is the night of my last drunk. And it wasn't my worst drunk. It was just my last drunk. And I'm on a blind date. Let's say I'm on a blind date with Phil. Guy's got to be desperate. I got the girl for you. You know, I'm still sporting that black eye. I mean, I'm nothing to look at. 
And I'm on this date, but I look across the room and there's Robert, the man I've been waiting for my whole life. And I leave my date to go home with another man. And in the middle of doing the nasty, I got a moment of clarity and I'm like, dude, I gotta go. And he's like, now? <laughs> I'm like, right now. And uh, cause see my drinking and my sex conduct went hand in hand. And uh, when you're a woman living like that, it's a very painful place to be. And it wasn't the first time that it happened to me and it wasn't gonna be the last time that happened to me. And uh, I got home and I picked up the phone and I called somebody that I met the year before who carried the message in an H and I, because I think always in the back of my mind, I knew and I kept their numbers in my wallet. And I, you know, I called up and I told him how bad it was. And he said, why don't you come up here to Lancaster? And I said, I, I don't have any gas. He says, Marion, if you get enough gas to get here, we're going to get you home. And I drove up and it was at the submachine shop. It's a Subway sandwich type place on Lancaster and 20th Street West and Avenue J. And, and uh, I walked in and he was a big guy with a big belly. And uh, he walked, he, I walked in that door and he stood out and he put his arms like that. And I just ran to him and he just held me to his chest and he just put those arms around me and I just started to sob and he just held me and he says, Marianne, you never have to feel this way again for the rest of your life, one day at a time if you don't want to. Man, I don't know how I'm not going to drink, but I can't keep living this way. I am just exhausted and he is, he has showed me on that first bit of hope here in AA. So I get a sponsor that's a gossip. I go and I find out everything about Carol F, Joyce C, and uh, Annette B. I'm like, holy gosh, because I'm not going to tell you about the men, the maggots, and the 50 bags of garbage. And she's telling me all of your juicy stuff. And I'm like, I am scared to death. And she wants me to do an inventory. I, I don't know. I, I don't even know anything about the first three steps. I don't even know if I'm alcoholic, right? Because it didn't matter that my bartender, my husband, my boyfriend, my parents, the judge, the law enforcement, and everybody else told me they thought I had an alcohol problem. Until I diagnosed myself, I don't have an alcohol problem. And so um, I hang with her for a little while, and I get engaged at three weeks of sobriety because, you know, why wouldn't I? Because I always do that. I don't even like him, but I needed him. And so what happens is uh, I'm hanging with the boys in AA because I've always hung out with the men because I don't know anything about having a relationship with women. I don't know anything about it. And so what happened is they're getting direction from the book Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm not getting that. And uh, I go to an old timer there and I said, hey, Jim, do you know, a, do you know a woman who uses the book? He'll take me through the steps. He goes, yeah, honey, here you go. Is that Vicky lady? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not calling her. Uh -uh. So uh, I suffer a while longer. I go to another guy and I said, hey, David, you know a woman who uses the book who'll take me through the steps? Yeah, honey, here you go, Vicky. I'm like, dang. You know, she had eight years of sobriety and I, I was certain she sponsored every woman in AA. And I had a whole story why she needed to sponsor me. She said, Marion, I'd be happy to. And you're a real alcoholic. And if you want to stay sober, you're going to have to take these steps. And you go to meetings early and stay late and stick out your hand to people with less time and empty ashtrays, wipe down tables and never turn down an AA request. And I said, okay, I don't even wanna be here with you. Now I have 34 years of sobriety, but I had such contempt for those men and women who tried to help me in the early days. I was the most unbearable woman sitting in that meeting. And if you tried to help me at any point, I would snap at you. And I had no idea that you were trying to save my life. But yet I knew I had to focus on one person and I decided that I had to trust that one person, which was Vicki. And we sat down and we read the doctor's opinion. And when I read that, I was like, oh my God, I'm an alcoholic. I had no idea. Just because I drink like that, I did not diagnose myself because I don't know what alcoholism is. I don't know that I have a physical allergy and a mental obsession. I don't know that the head telling me you can have just two, stay away from the tequila, eat dinner first. And that's gonna be, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's a good idea right? Because I do that every time and every time I have trouble. And then once I start to drink, I can't stop. I can't stop with one or two. That's why when I came in in 1986, people would say, it's the first drink that gets you drunk. I'm like, no, it's not. It's like the fifth. You're, you're a bunch of lightweights. But I learned what it means to be the first one that's going to get me drunk. So I diagnosed myself, but I can't tell you my life is unmanageable. And so I'm talking about on the outside, because now I'm not taking the clothes out of the trunk of my car. I'm showing up to my job. I'm paying my bills. And Vicky's trying to talk to me about how my life is a manager. I'm just basically dressing up the trash can. So at nine months of sobriety, I go on a cruise with the normal 
normie. She goes, oh, you could probably drink. I go, yep, probably the first day, maybe even the second day, third day, naked, hanging from the flagpole. She's like, oh, because she's never seen me drink. And I had my first unguarded moment there. And I'd known enough about the literature where it was. I'm standing there. She's on the, we're on the way to the casino. And she goes, I want to get a drink. And I'm watching that Kahlua and cream makeup. And I'm like, oh my God, I want a drink. Oh God, maybe I could have a sip. <laughs> Let me lick the straw. And I grabbed the bar and I closed my eyes. And I said, my name is Mary and I'm an alcoholic. God help me. I don't want to drink. And she goes, okay. And we went to the casino. I said, I'll be right back. And I went and got my big book. And I opened it up to chapter three, the insidious insanity of the first drink. But that trip wasn't successful. I'm engaged to be married and I had sex with another man on that ship. My ego came into play. There were a bunch of young women. There was a good looking guy, kind of looked like Sylvester Stallone and everybody's eyeing, you know, and I can't let anybody else win. So, and that's the sad thing is they're probably all looking at me like, isn't she engaged? But that doesn't matter to people like me. And I got home and I called my sponsor. I said, Vicki, I may not be drinking or doing anything else, but nothing in my life has changed. I'm doing the same thing at the expense of everybody in my life. What I've always done, what do I have to do? And she said, it's about time. And then I have to come to believe that my sponsor was a fundamentalist born again Christian and I wasn't, but she had a relationship with God that just amazed me. And, uh, you know, I, we went through we agnostics. I don't get it. Read it again. Read it again. I don't get it. Read it again. 20 more times. Vicki, I don't get it. Because I'm reading it from the viewpoint of the agnostic. I'm not an agnostic. I believed in God. I was, went to church as a kid. I had to say Jesus loves me. I mean, it means nothing to me. And that chapter is such a great chapter for me when I really, because I, I read it and I go, there it is. When I was driven to AA by a self-imposed crisis, I could neither postpone nor evade. I had to fearlessly face the proposition that God is everything or else he's nothing. He either is or he is, and what do you choose? So I called Vicki, I go, oh, I got it. God is, so God's everything. Till the next line says, arrived at this point, we're squarely confronted with the question of faith. It talks about stepping off the bridge of reason to the shore of faith. And I can't do that. And I said, Vicki, I can't. She goes, you have to. I said, I, I can't, I know my life is a mess but I can't do it. She said, Marion, if you can't do this, you're probably gonna have to drink again. So I got back into that book and it asked me all these questions. Don't, you know, ask yourselves what these spiritual terms, don't let it deter you from honestly asking what they mean to you. It asked me several times about laying down prejudice. I got all kinds of ideas about God or religion or church or whatever. And where do those come from? And how am I ever gonna establish a relationship with a God of my own understanding with all this stuff in my head? Because at the end of that chapter, it's a fabulous chapter. And it says, if we help sweep away prejudice, enabled you to think honestly and search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you could find, join us. And that's what I had to do. I had to lay aside my prejudice, think honestly and search diligently. And when that happened, I could do the third step with my sponsor. And I got on my knees and I, it was the first time I've ever been on my knees praying out loud with another person and I cried. It allowed me another level of humility that was impossible for me before that moment. And then I had to do that inventory, my resentment, my fear, and my sex conduct. And my resentments, obviously, you know, there's all kinds of people that I have resentments with, institutions and principles. And I wrote those all out. And when I got done with the three columns, it asked us to look at it and then look at it again from an entirely different angle. And it asked me to pray. They, like me, are sick too. And I had to pray for each person that's on there with each resentment, help me to treat them this way. God saved me from being angry. And I could look at it from a different angle because it says if we were to live, we had to be free of anger. Well, I've been living, but I am not free of anger. And when I was done with that, then it says I resolutely look for my mistake. My mistake. I didn't even know that I had anything to do with it. And then behind every resentment, I'm driven by fear, 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 fear what I'm not going to get, that you don't like me, that what you think about me, how I'm going to look, what's this going to be? Everything is driven by fear. All of my resentments are fear-based. And then I love it because it says we ask God to remove our fears and direct our attention to what he'd have us be. Not do, I do a lot. What he'd have me be at once. We commence to outgrow fear. And then my sex conduct. And if you're a woman like me, or you're new here and you're worried about all that stuff, it says for our future conduct. And it allowed me to be free of the past. 
that allowed me to become the woman that I've always wanted to be with some decency and dignity in my life that I hadn't had for a very long time. And uh, I laid that all out for my sponsor. She came over and it says, you know, we're prepared for a long talk. I, I talked for seven hours. I cried mostly for seven hours because I shared everything about me. It was the most intimate I've ever been with another human being in my life. I've been intimate in a lot of ways, but never like that. And when I was done, we took the directions down and we read them. And then she gave me that hour. She went home and, and then it says, uh, you know, uh, it says our fears fall from us. We can be at perfect peace and ease. We can look the world in the eye. And, and I tell people that the silence was deafening because while I'm laying there in that hour of prayer and meditation and reviewing what I've just done, I tell it that the silence was deafening because it was like, there was nothing. And it was the first time that I didn't have all that chatter in my head. And afterwards, I called Vicki and she said, you know, I told her, I said, that was really scary. She says, well, that's how it's supposed to be, because I was free from that past that I carried. And then she said, are you ready? And I said, do step six. I said, yep. She goes, entirely ready. I'm like, well, nope. I mean, who's entirely ready? And I love that they talk about that in step six in the 12 and 12, because there's not much instruction in the, in the big book, but it facilitated an open discussion between her and I. And she sent me out because, see, I see these all these character defects are from my past. Look at this inventory. It's all my past stuff, but what about my current stuff? So she sent me out to go out into the world and see where they all come into play because now I have a list of those defects. So I got to tell you a couple of them. So, like, I see Joyce and she's got really lovely hair down there. And, uh, you know, she walks into a meeting and I look at her and I'm like, if she thinks she is a model or something. God, right? I got envy. I want those big ones when I'm raging angry to be removed because you see them because it does talk about, um, you know, why I want them to removed and what God wants them removed. So, but the subtle ones, the ones that you don't know about, and I can't even help her. I don't care if she's 20 days or 20 years and she might be struggling with something because I got some kind of envy when she walks into that room. And I'll tell you how bad it was. I used to go to a morning meeting, 7 a.m. All the windows are open. The lights are on. I walk in. I'm not there very early. And that's probably the problem. And I walk in and there's a guy sitting there with the sunglasses on. I'm like, oh, if you look at that dude, he's so hip slick and sick. Blah, 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 blah. For an hour and a half, because our meetings are an hour and a half in California, I'm bad mouthing that guy in my head. And then he got up with his cane because <laughs> like, I'm judgmental because, I, you know, I don't even know the story, but I've written the whole damn story out. And I'm like, I came back to my sponsor and I'm like, oh, my God, I can see where they separate me from you and from God and everybody else. So then we did the seven step prayer on our knees and she asked me to begin to practice the character assets the opposites of all my defects. If I'm rude, I gotta be kind. If I'm mean, I gotta be nice. I gotta be patient instead of impatient. All the opposites of the traits that I didn't come to you with. And I had to do them even though I didn't feel them. And then I had to go out and make the list of the people I'd harmed. You know, I looked to see how I harmed them emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. And you know what? Because how do I give back to my parents that emotional sobriety the security that I robbed from them when they laid in bed night after the night, if they were getting a call that tonight's the night I'm dead. How do you give that back to your mom and dad? I, I stole from them. I stole my dad's coin collection. My dad is a, was a blue collar worker. And he worked hard. But my, and when I got caught, he said, why would you do that? I don't know, because that's always been my answer. I don't know, I don't know. But through the steps I learned, you know, I love it. It says we extract those things, those personality traits that injured and disturbed others, how I harm them with those personality traits, those character defects. So when I came back to make amends to my father over that, um, you know, I, I said, uh, let me tell you why, because it was the early seventies or whatever. And uh, I got two, $2 a week allowance and two of my girlfriends, their fathers had died and their mothers got social security. And so they got $20 a week. Well, when you drink and smoke and do other things, I need to be in my group of friends. I am so terrified that if I don't produce that, they're going to tell me you can't hang out with us anymore. 
and I'm willing to rob from my own family so I can stay in your group. And when I told that to my dad, I think he was a little taken back by it, but I also know he was grateful to know why I did those things because my whole life I said, I don't know, I don't know, who cares? I don't know. So I'm very grateful about that. <clears throat> and uh, the 10th step, continue to take personal inventory and when we're wrong, promptly admit it. You know, I love it in the 10th step, it talks about, um, it's easy to rest up on the spiritual program of action and we're in trouble if we do for alcohol is a subtle foe. And so what happens is uh, I am uh, seven years sober, I'm good. I'll call my sponsor tomorrow, God, I'm busy. I don't wanna go to that meeting and he'll fill share tomorrow, no. Mm -mm. Survivors on, and then things are still going swimmingly well. I'll call my sponsor later. God, I'm busy. I don't want to go to that meeting. If Phil's going to be there, uh -uh, I'm done listening to that guy. And things are swimmingly well until the day they're not. And my head is screaming, and I'm driving home from my job. And finally, I hear this voice that says, Are you done yet? And I picked up the phone and I called a woman I hardly know. I said, Cindy, I'm in trouble. She said, Are you drinking? And I said, Not yet. See, because I let the life that AA gave me get in the way of my AA life. My life is really good at seven years of sobriety. And then again, at 13 years of sobriety, I did the same darn thing. I'm like, how could that be? Since then, I'm actively sponsored. I'm actively in the middle of AA. I don't stay home to watch the season finale of Survivor. You know, um, I'm current with my sponsor. I have service commitments all in AA, and I'm really grateful for that. And I, and I keep my garden clean, you know. And then uh, the 11 steps sought through prayer and meditation. When I got here, I told you I don't have a relationship with God. I don't know how to have a relationship. And Vicki asked me, she goes, can you just start by saying, God, keep me sober today. And at the end of the day, thank you, God. I said, I could do that. Because that woman sold me on my second bit of hope. When I got here, I was pretty tore up. And she said, God loves you and forgives you. I'm like, okay. She believed it. And I told you I decided to believe Vicki. And so my conception was that God loved me and forgave me. He was all powerful and he could grant me mercy. And that became my conception. And that's always remained my conception in 34 years. My reliance upon that relationship with God has grown. But the conception has never changed. And so I started to learn how to pray. And, uh, and then the practice that meditation. And, um, so, you know, it, I love it. I, in California, I lived in the desert, but I had a pretty lovely backyard and it was green. And I used to sit out there with my big old dog named Wally high strung dog. And I'd sit out in the grass and meditate. Can't do that here. Too many bugs, but there you can. And, uh, he'd be waiting and he knows he's going to get brushed when I'm done. And, uh, and I'm saying, you know, my prayers and I'm thinking that I go through the 11 step St. Francis of Assisi prayer and my dog Wally is waiting. And when I'm all done, I start brushing him. And then immediately my head starts going, oh, I got to make that phone call. Do I got to do that? What do I got to get out for dinner? What time is that happening today? Oh, I got to take care of that. What is this? I am already out there. I'm already, I was just right here with God. And now I'm out there and I'm brushing my dog who's high strung and she lays down on my lap and I'm still thinking all these things. And then my dog turns her face to the sun and she has the biggest smile on her face. And I realize that my dog is in the presence. This high strung dog has stopped and she is right here right now. And I realize that I can stop at any moment and be right here right now with God. And the 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, to tell you where I was to where I am now, it's the direct result of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And to carry this message, to practice these principles in all our affairs. So I went on my first H&I panel at 30 Days of Sobriety. I'm with this big guy named Jay in a big old red pickup truck. And I go, I'm 26, I'm all cute. I go, I don't know anything about staying sober. He goes, that's right, you don't. You know about relapse, you talk about that. Talked about smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and running my mouth. I don't know anything about staying sober. And, uh, but I was hooked on the H&I bug, and I started doing it. And the miracle started to happen because I got that sponsor. I started doing the steps. I had the boys up at Camp Scudder. It's a girls' facility now, but it was juvenile boys at the time. And, uh, and for an hour and a half, I thought about somebody else. I'd get out of that meeting, and I'd come out, and I'd feel like really good. And the next day, I'd be back to myself. And so I took another one there, and I took one at 
Tehachapi State Prison, Acton Rehab, Palmdale Hospital, Antelope Valley Hospital. I got all into AA. I got all into carrying the message because I got out of myself. Because for that hour and a half, I thought about somebody other than me. And uh, I've been doing corrections work ever since. Um, I thought my husband took this Christmas card I got from one of my inmates up here in Morgan County Correction here in, in East Tennessee uh, a couple of years ago. And he had it framed for me. I thought I threw it away. And I'm like, I can't believe I threw up the card because my husband knows how I feel about corrections. But my husband had taken it and then put it in a frame and the kids and grandkids were here for Christmas. And I thought it was a picture from them and I opened it and he framed this Christmas card with this lovely note from my, my friend, Billy. And, um, and watching the miracles of Alcoholics Anonymous happen in those men's lives. And I love it. And if you've never done corrections work, it's the best thing. And uh, I've gone from minimum to maximum security and everything in between. They come in with a gun and maximum security in California and, and uh, <laughs> level three at Tehachapi, they said, well, when they open it, they go, you have to wear a vest. I go, oh, okay. I'm thinking it's like the handicap vest, right? So we get into the yard and it's me, my friend, Diane, and my friend, Tony. And we walk in and they hang us like, it's like a bulletproof vest, but it's a sticking vest. So if they shank you, your organs are covered. And I'm like, oh, because <laughs> they like to stick people. So I put the vest on and it fits me beautifully. And my friend, Diane is half the size of me and it's her, but Tony is a big, heavy, really big guy. And that vest only covers right below his breast and his whole side is open. And, and we're standing there waiting and Tony's reading something off the board. I'm like, oh my God, would you look at him? He's a sitting duck. Tony's a sitting duck. And we start laughing and Diane goes, yeah, but they could stick us in the neck or our eye. They could take out our eye. And I go, I, my name is Nettie and I'm an alcoholic. She goes, you could be the pirate AA. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of fun that we get to do and carrying the message inside the institutions. And if you've never done it, I'm gonna encourage you to go do it. And uh, it's my one of my most favorite service commitments that I do. And, uh, you know, I go up here. The first thing I had trouble when I moved from California here five years ago, AA is a little different. Our meetings are, we open an hour in advance for the fellowship and uh, have service commitments. And then we all go out afterwards and they didn't do that here. And I'd get to the meeting and the guy with the key would show up two, two minutes before and a, a minute afterwards, they're all got, gone except me going to the bathroom and the guy with the key and I would call my sponsor crying. And she goes, well, what do you think you could do about that? I don't know. I know what she's asked me to do, but I don't want to do it. And then they don't even have corrections there. She goes, well, maybe that's why you moved. Well, that's not why I moved, Cindy. That's ridiculous, <laughs> you know? And I, the last night I'm driving out of that, uh, I got uh, into the prison after 90 days of being here and it gave me that solid foundation. And after one of my meetings on a Monday night, they're all gone at a minute after the meeting. And I picked up the phone and I called the two men I travel up to the prison with. I said, would you guys like to have dinner on Tuesday? Because that's what my sponsor is asking me create the fellowship you crave. And we've been having dinner every Tuesday night since then, other than the last year and a half that the prison's been locked down. My life is full because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And even though this is probably the hardest time in my life, um, you know, with the, the situations that are coming down the pike, I'm so grateful that I'm sober, that I'm allowed to have those relationships with my family that, uh, you know, today I, you know, I told my daddy he'd been a good dad. And I thanked him for that. And he said, okay, because I think he needs to hear that too. And I told him, we're all going to be okay. And we're going to look after mom. And he's like, okay. Because I told him that I made an appointment for hospice. And so he's done. And as much as I love him, I need to let him be done. So I know I'm crying about this stuff, but I'm joyful, joyously dealing with the realities of life. And my husband's, I'm flying out next Thursday. His father's funeral is Friday. And my husband has, you know, we both got sober in California and his men friends have rallied around and have just loved on him. And one of the hardest things to be alcoholic is to accept help, you know? And I've been able to accept the hugs and somebody bringing over dinner. I mean, it's been a long seven months with my dad and let us bring you dinner tonight and, and the hug and a kind act and being able to accept those instead of my whole life. I've been like, oh, I got this, I got this. 
But instead, I don't have to say I got that. God's got me and you all got me. And, uh, and the men and women who have done this before me are showing me this is how we do it with our parents. So one day I'll be able to tell one of you people on there, this is how I did it with my parents. And I'm so grateful that you all showed me what to do and gave me the life that I have today. And I'm so grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you.